good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series, uh, Encounters of Hope, uh, Evangelization, the process of evangelization in our daily lives. I'm really grateful uh, that so many of you have registered to come out and join us today, and I hope that you'll find our, our time together fruitful uh, and helpful for you in your work. My name is Mark Shea Lawrence. I'm the director for the Office of Evangelization and Catechesis here at the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. At this time, I would like to introduce you to uh, Bishop uh, Bart Van Royen from the Diocese of Cornerbrook and Labrador. He's also a member of the Episcopal Commission for Evangelization and Catechesis. And I invite him to bring bring forth uh, greetings and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Bishop Bart. As uh, one of the members of the Episcopal Commission of Evangelization and Catechesis, I'd like to welcome all of you who have chosen uh, to attend this webinar series entitled Encounters of Hope. I hope that the next four sessions will be both informative and inspiring uh, for your ministry and for your lives. On your behalf and on behalf of the Commission, I would like to thank Marg Shea Lawrence for organizing this webinar and for the presenters, especially uh, Juliana today, for accepting her invitation to participate and to present to us. Let us begin with a prayer. Lord God, as we begin this new initiative, we pray that you may send your Holy Spirit to strengthen and guide our presenters, especially Juliana today, and to give us hearts that are open to hear your voice in that which we are about to hear, and to bless each one of us into, into your ministry. Help us to see beyond ourselves and the agendas and plans that often prevent us from being true instruments of your presence and love. To consider the beauty of each encounter as an opportunity to share in your love, forgiveness and healing and the new life you won for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Bart. Very, very, very much appreciate your support and your being here today. Our first series presenter, Julianne Stans, is the Director of Discipleship and Parish Life for the Diocese of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, Julianne is consultant to the uh, United States Catholic Conference of, uh, the Conference of Bishops uh, on the Committee for Evangelization and Catechesis. Julianne has been profoundly influenced by her life growing up in Ireland and the witness of the early Christian saints. She is the author of the book, Braving the Thin Places, Celtic Wisdom to Create a Space for Grace, and Start with Jesus, How Everyday Disciples Will, will Renew the Church, published by Loy Loyola Press. She blogs monthly for the website, uh, The Catechist Journey, and she is married with three children. I first encountered Julianne at a major Congress that was being sponsored by the US bishops. It was in Florida, really hot Florida days down at like the end of June or something. Um, anyway, uh, she was one of the moderators of the meeting and, and presenters as well. And of course, I was first attracted by her Irish accent. Uh, and then, of course, her ability to articulate a vision for evangelization in our church today. Please welcome Julianne Stance. Thank you so much, Marge. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with me today. I am originally from Ireland, but I am uh, standing in my office in Green Bay, Wisconsin, here at the diocesan offices, with life merrily happening all around me here um, with my parish life team. I'd love for you to use the chat bar. I'd love to know what ministries are represented here today. 
So if you could tell me, you know, if you're a catechist or a catechetical leader, a director of discipleship or evangelization, um, seeing somebody coming in who's doing high, high school chaplaincy work, which is so important. Um, some folks are doing catechesis of the Good Shepherd. RCA directors, please keep those coming in. I love to know who's here with us in, the, in this room. Small faith group ministry, youth ministry, RCIA, adult faith formation, sacramental prep, diocesan office of evangelization, parish minister, teachers, some teacher folks are joining us today, archdiocese, uh, adult faith formation, that's a ministry near and dear to my heart, pastoral care ministry. So we have a variety of ministries here today, um, which is just wonderful. This is an example of the church really drawing um, everyone together to really have this conversation on evangelization and encounters of hope. Um, one of the inspirations that came from uh, my prayer in terms of presenting for you was this quote from St. John Paul II, who reminds us that humanity is able to hope, indeed that we must have hope in the living and personal gospel. Jesus Christ himself is the good news and the bearer of joy that the church announces each day and to whom the church bears testimony before, before all people. So I just love that quote from St. John Paul II. Um, and then he goes on further to say this, that the lay faithful, meaning you and I and all the ministries that we are doing, um, co-responsible with our clergy, have an especially essential and irreplaceable role in this announcement and in this testimony. So today we're going to talk a little bit about evangelization and encounters of hope. I'm going to tell you, I have about 50 slides. Um, my superpower is to give people far too much information. But the good news is that you will be able to have this information for later to unpack with your parish staff and teams. Um, feel free to use the Q&A tab to get some um, questions coming in right away for me. I'm pretty adept at seeing questions come in and using the chat bar at the same time. And I'll also be screen sharing as well. I'm very, very grateful to everyone who's telling me um, all the different ministries that they're engaged in with graduate students, uh, sacramental prep, faith formation coordinators. This is an especially auspicious time, I feel like, as a church. Um, it's very providential to be talking about encounters of hope during Lent as we approach Holy Week, uh, particularly with the Sunday's Gospel reading and um, how Jesus ministers so personally, so profoundly personally to each person that he encounters. I wanted to share with you just a couple of things that came to me as I was looking at this um, title. And the first one here, bear with me as I'm toggling back and forth here. But when I think about hope, and which is what we're called to as a people, as a church right now, particularly with a lot of the doom and gloom in the news, unfortunately, is the words hope can be broken down as follows. Healing, openness, prayer, and Eucharist. So how can we facilitate encounters with Jesus Christ that are healing, that open people up to the grace of the Holy Spirit, that lead people into deeper encounter with prayer and really nourish us in the Eucharist. So that's what we're going to look at today. I will kind of turn off my screen share at various points just so I can kind of take a breath and I can see um, some of the chat that's coming in. Um, but we're gonna go through this. I'll tell you a little bit about myself as well. Um, I was introduced, I have three um, children. I'm a mom, I'm a minister. I live um, right by Lake Michigan, where it gets to be quite cold. Um, I know that many of you know <laughs> what the frozen tundra is really like. Um, I live very close to a lighthouse here. That's a little image of me actually going out for my morning walk. Somebody caught me on my morning walk. Um, so I've been in ministry for, for many, many years. Um, grew up in Ireland, educated in Ireland, and came um, into the United States. I've worked at parish ministry for 15 years, for diocesan ministry for 15 years. And by the grace of God, I also consult to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, particularly in the areas of evangelization and catechesis. And I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, this is the village I grew up with. I grew up in in Ireland, um, Wicklow, uh, County Carlo area, right on the border there. Pardon me as I just take a, a quick drink. Um, so I came over here after finishing my education. Uh, very, very blessed to, to draw on the wealth of formation that I received in Ireland. Um, as Marge mentioned, I like to write books um, and Start With Jesus was um, 
was an important book for me to write because I really wanted us as a church to kind of look at a back to basics approach. And this is just a very simple quote. We need to start with Jesus, what he did and what he asked us to do. So as I was looking at that, um, this has really given us an opportunity. And Marge mentioned the new book that I have. So shameless promo here. But I really wanted to talk about this moment that we are in, this kind of ongoing pandemic reality and really what's happening. And, and th this is the kind of premise of the book. It's clear that we've entered an epoch marked by upheaval and spiritual displacement, but also one characterized by a deeper search and longing for God. Um, so what's going on? I believe that we, the people, have entered a liminal space, a threshold place, or an in-between place. And this is the context in which you're ministering today. So nobody likes to talk about a pandemic or what I call the great pause of 2020. But I feel like uh, we need to start talking about that because we have this reality that a lot of the things that we were doing in ministry were no longer bearing fruit or had not borne fruit for many, many years. And so the pandemic kind of ground much of our ministerial efforts to a halt. And there were a lot of challenges, but also opportunities. One of the opportunities that we had was technology and the ability to interface with each other um, in new ways. Um, Today is a great example of that. So as things started to pause in our parishes, we had the opportunity to really look with hopeful and hope-filled eyes um, at our mission and our ministries and really talk about how we were going to live our faith and our church life differently. I also want to mention that these slides will be available for you. So if you're like frantically taking notes because I do speak fast and I, I own that, I'm gonna try and slow myself down. Um, I will make sure to send you these notes, but also I'll send a couple of resources that I'll mention that you can use in, in your particular ministerial context. So the great pause of 2020 happened. And as life ground to a halt, many of us unfortunately found as ministers that we moved from being ministers to managers because we had to deal with things we'd never dealt with before like sanitization protocols, keeping people safe, roping off pews, closing doors of buildings, all of that took its toll on us. And I have worked so closely with parish staff. And if you are feeling any of these things, you are not alone. Researchers are saying that we're feeling um, these four Fs, fear, frustration, fatigue, which all leads to kind of this middle child of floundering. So maybe you're uh, beyond some of these things, but at some point during the pandemic, all of us did feel a sense of fear, for our loved ones, for, for the health of our families, for our children. But because we moved so much out of ministry into management, we started to feel fatigued um, because this is not what we were we signed up to do. I heard that so many times from our pastors, especially. Many of us were frustrated during the pandemic and it's led to a sense of floundering in our mission. So if that is you and you're here today saying, oh, you're naming what I'm feeling right now, just hang in there. This is what we call a liminal time as a church, a threshold time, an in-between time. Lent is also that for us, sacramentally speaking. For some of you, the pandemic brought a greater sense of joy and peace, um, hope or else calmness. You weren't caught up in traffic all the time and so I really think that this is as an important consideration for us is you know to look at what are our peer people experiencing what are we experiencing because we can't talk about ministering differently in fresh and new ways unless we really talk about what the last two years have brought and where the challenges are now just moving into this a little bit um, I would say that this is a thin time to use a very Irish term this is a betwixt and between time for us as church communities. Where do we go? How do we reach people? What do our faith formation efforts look like? How do we get them back? If you found yourself asking those kinds of questions, it's because we seem to be bogged down um, with the weight of what has happened in the world. And I think it's important to contextualize that for us because as we push into offering new events, programs, ministries, ministering in different ways, we have to know the good soil. The, the, the parable of the sower teaches us that we should know the soil in which we are sowing the seed. And today the soil is being sowed in conversation and politics and social media. 
that is particularly difficult, or I would say thick. It's heavy. And so as, um, as the pandemic rolled around for many of our families our, and all of the requirements were moving, it does not feel that this was a very, very lighthearted time. So I just want to acknowledge that because I think it's tempting sometimes to just say, let's go back to normal. But the reality is what we were doing before largely in many of our ministries was no longer fruitful. So let's talk about that, right? So first thing I would say is in order to press into um, offering encounters of hope, it's important to recognize that you are a minister and not a manager. And yes, management is part of leadership and leadership is part of governance and governance as a church is what we're called to. But for many of us, because the pace of the work really kind of concentrated during the pandemic, we found we were focusing so much on mission and ministry and not ministering out of our relationship with the Lord. So relationship, identity, and vocation are always followed by mission and ministry. So you're not defined by what you do, but who you are. And so I think when we talk about encounters of hope, we have to recognize that we need to move back into a ministerial context to root people into a relationship with Christ so that our dialogue can be fruitful and fertile and not um, and not really um, parched. And I'm seeing some comments coming in. Thank you for the slides. And we definitely have some political challenges in our way. Um, I also believe that we as a church have a huge opportunity to minister to God's people in different ways, in new ways, and in some ways in old ways that we need to recover again. Please, thank you so much for sharing your comments and your uh, conversation with me. So this is a liminal time. It's a time that's a threshold or a point of entering and beginning for us. And it's important that we look at this time and really take the lessons that we've learned over the last two years and really look at how do we serve God's people who are as hungry and even hungrier than ever for the gospel. So when I think about 2020, which is when the pandemic really started really kind of moving across the world, what comes to me is that expression that 2020 is perfect vision. And so we as human beings do not have perfect vision on our ministries. You know, we're so involved. We love what we're doing so much, but God has perfect vision, right? Because 2020 vision is considered perfect. And it actually measures um, visual acuity at a distance of 20 feet. So that's what 2020 vision is. So the question I would ask is, what do you think God is preparing for us. What is this time looking like? And even deeper than that, what is the minister ministerial moment that we are called to in this thin space as a church and as a community? I call this my thin space because I love this, this um, note from Redemptorist Missio here that God is opening up for the church the horizons of a humanity more fully prepared for the sowing of the gospel, not less prepared, but more fully prepared. So the soil that the seed of, of life is being planted in is this ministerial context of difficult um, conversations, of difficult politics. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling backwards there for a minute to rethink as Amber says in the chat bar today, how we do ministry differently um, how are we involved? How are we reaching out to God's people during this time? Um, yes, Natalie is indicating here in the question and answer bar to me, it's not what you do, but who you are. Actions do indicate character, but as ministers, we need to be rooted in our relationship with Jesus Christ and ministry should flow from that. But that's where the vocation piece comes in. Um, I am called to be a wife and a mother and ministry is one expression of how I lived that out. So we've got to be clear with that dynamic many times. Okay, so this to me is one of the most hope-filled moments for us as a church in which to preach and teach the gospel as never before. So let's keep going here. I want you to take a look at this question right now with me, but this is the one I reframed from earlier. What is the spiritual moment 
that you believe God is calling us to as a church right now? So you to think about that and feel free to share that either in the Q&A tab or in the chat bar. Um, somebody is saying, I believe that it's to renewal, to uh, adaptation to today's reality. And then somebody else is saying the challenge is to be able to see it in this light because we can be overwhelmed by fear and frustration. These are beautiful insights, so keep them coming in. To be inspiring, I've been introducing dance and music. Um, come back to me. I think that's really key, Nancy. Come back to me with your whole heart. To consider more non-gathered ways, non-programmatic ways to work together, to repair the church with compassion. That is beautiful. And actually, that's a theme I'll pick up a little later. Um, somebody else is saying that I think we've been too complacent as a time uh, as, a, as a church for too long. And that's correct. Many people have kind of voted with their feet to use that imagery. And um, this comment is really speaking to that. For us to go outside our walls to the periphery. Yes, you know, Jesus said, come, come to me. But then he said, go and teach, go and preach. And I think sometimes we've been too heavily dependent on a methodology that's relied on kind of a common learn methodology, which there's value to, but we have to balance that too. Um, for us to go outside our walls to the periphery, to the margins, to give people a secure place of rest, to be humble and open, not just renewal, but recreation, to listen, to wake up and hear the voice of Jesus, to be a listening church. So there's incredible, incredible messages that are coming in. By the way, if you would like to, sh to save those beautiful insights, there are three little dots down at the bottom of the chat bar where you can click on where, and it says save chat, and it will actually save to your com computer. And I would encourage the host to also save the chat since there's such beautiful insights that are coming here. More time for the Holy Spirit, more time to be able to listen to God. And I say, amen. So let's keep going here. So I believe that this is a time for us to get back to our roots. I think for a lot of our folks today, they are not sure what the church teaches, why it's teaching, what it's teaching, and how it applies to real life today. So I'm going to take you into a methodology that we use very, very much in our discipleship efforts. It may be new for some of you. For some of you, it won't be new. But it's going to help bring a few things together in a very, very concrete and tangible way. Just a little note about me, I'm a very, very practical person. So I like to be able to go to a webinar and come away with something that I can implement right away in my own ministerial context. And I certainly wanna be able to provide that for you today. So this is where we get into some of the practicalities of our conversation. Couple of things here. First of all, we are disciples of a person, not a program. So we are disciples of Jesus Christ, and he is the master. The word disciple comes from the Greek word for student. We are students of Jesus Christ. So discipleship always happens in a relational context. In fact, I often tell our folks here in Green Bay that discipleship moves at the speed of trust, the trust that you have in the person that's walking with you. And so we need to be able to model our accompaniment efforts um, in a trusting way with people. I know that one of your upcoming sessions is the art of a compliment. And um, I hope that you will enjoy your session too with Father Frank Donio. He and I have worked very, very closely on some of these principles. So they're gonna be, it's gonna be a very interesting conversation. The second thing is, I think sometimes we talk about faith formation and we talk about um, school um, and, and religion as a subject to be taught in the same way that geography and, and math is a subject. You know, here we go to, to school and we learn certain things, but discipleship is a way of life and it's a relationship. And so I really think that we have to break a little bit of our programmatic dependence. Now, say, say um, I just wanna share this with you. I am not opposed to programs. Programs are springboards, okay? and springboards for us to bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. We always have to, to um, emphasize relationship with Jesus, but relationship within the wider context of the community. I see a note coming in here saying, is this all just about Jesus? Absolutely not. There are a lot of components to our faith. There's our relationship with God, 
the Father. There's our relationship, a living relationship with Jesus Christ and walking with him. He is our master. We are his students. But then the animation that comes from the Holy Spirit includes also uh, the saints and the communion of saints who light the way for us. This is not a simple framework. It's nuanced and it's complex, but it's important that we talk about it. The second thing is disciples make disciples. Um, I think for a lot of times we have emphasized sometimes that we, we pop in um, a DVD and then, you know, eight weeks out the other side comes a disciple. It does not work that way. This is one of the pieces um, that we have to be cognizant of. Um, the other thing is you can only lead someone as far as you've gone yourself as a disciple. These are what we call our four sort of four laws of discipleship. There are certainly others you can add, but these seem to be some of the universal principles around disciple making. Again, if you have questions on those, certainly get those into me. I'll be happy to answer those live and um, actually when we get to our Q&A session as well. Now, this is the framework that I really wanted to introduce to you today. I think this is hugely important. If you are have your headphones in and your, your, your um, video chat is off and you're taking notes and you're working on something right now, this is the moment I would say to be attentive to. This is a framework that I use um, many, many times. And in fact, Gloria in our chat bar today is saying, many times faith is caught and not taught. True. Those two pieces are going to come together, caught, thought, and um, actually taught all come together when it comes to faith. So when we look at Jesus's life, this is what I talk about getting back to our roots. And I'm using this image of the tree that came up in an earlier slide. Okay, if you want to have fruitfulness, you need to look at rootedness, right? Um, as one of my friends who's from the South says here, um, she says, if you, if you don't nourish your roots, you ain't going to get any fruits, right? And I love how colloquial she puts that. For a lot of times, our message as a church has been to focus on the branches of the tree. Like if you have youth ministry, you're going to have a vibrant parish. Oh, no, if you have great adult faith formation, you're going to have a vibrant parish. No, if you emphasize stewardship. Have you ever heard of those kinds of conversations? And part of that is that is all true, but it's like looking at the branches of a tree. If we focus on the roots of the tree, which are discipleship, rooted in Jesus Christ and his teachings, lived and expressed in community in the church, you're going to see all of those other ministries flourish. So yes, you have a vibrant youth ministry program if, if you're rooted in that discipleship relationship and the same for all those ministries. So moving forward a little bit here. So this is Jesus's scriptural process of making disciples. Okay, so this is really, really important here, right? Um, I want you to follow this closely with me I, because this is going to be very important when I show you the next couple of slides here. I especially want to make sure that you understand this framework as it's applied then to the paradigm that's going to be coming. So when you look at Jesus's process of making disciples, the first thing that Jesus does is he goes away to pray with his father. So prayer is, again, hope, healing, openness, prayer, Eucharist. Prayer, we need to be prayerful people. We need to be centered in our faith in order to be able to go out. Jesus goes away to pray, and then he comes and he chooses the disciples. And the first thing that he says to folks is, come to me. Okay, come to me, all you who are weary all you who are in need of rest, come to me. And only after they have come to Jesus or had an encounter, does he then say, follow me. Okay, does he then say, follow me. And then as the disciples are walking with Jesus, this culminates for Jesus in the Eucharist, in the Last Supper, when Jesus says to them, remain united with me. This is a nod here to the sacramental life of the church, particularly expressed in and through the Eucharist. And then does he say, go and make disciples. So there's a very, there's, you know, there's a process here that we have to pay attention to. Part of our struggle as a church is that we are asking people to go and make disciples who are in that come and see stage. Okay, so this is really an important consideration here for us. Okay, you're with me so far? Thank you. I'm seeing those chats come in. 
And I think we've got some great insights. I'm going to keep going. So bear with me here. This all comes together in a few moments. I want to talk to you about the new directory for catechesis. I had seen some early drafts of that document, in fact. And the section that most set my heart on fire um, before the release of the document was section 160. And these are the elements of Jesus's um, work of discipleship and encounter. So Jesus explains to people in greater depth. He introduces people to prayer. He sends them on mission, not alone, but as a little community. Jesus is both able to welcome and provoke. And provoke here is used not in the sense that we typically use it in, but we, we Jesus provoked people's imagination and curiosity. So it's not always a very adversarial approach, but it's certainly what we would say, sharpening the picket for people, asking difficult questions. He draws near to the disciples. He walks with them. He dialogues. He shares their sorrow. He opens their hearts. He leads them to the experience of the Eucharist. And then I, I love this piece, so I have it in red for you here. He steps aside to leave a space for the missionary initiative of the, of the disciples. Every one of us is going to form disciples in our own ministerial way a little differently. And we have to be okay with that. Um, this is where we have to talk about the pastoral conversion of our ministry practices um, as we walk with people. So we are going to really draw into that here with me. Okay, so this next chart is kind of a horrifying thing. Um, it's awful, I'll just own that right away, but here's how it works, stay with me. So if you go to the very, very bottom of the chart, and I hope that you can see this right now, you're going to see the scriptural process that Jesus outlines for us. Come and see, follow me, remain united with me, and go and make disciples. Now, if you look at the discipleship process, if you look at all the documents of the church, Evangelii Nunciandi, Evangelii Gaudium, you're going to be familiar with these stages, particularly if you work in RCIA. So these stages at the top, pre-evangelization, evangelization, discipleship, and missionary discipleship are all the stages that happen within the life of discipleship. Catechesis also happens, but it's most fruitful. There is informal catechesis that happens at every stage, but formal catechesis is typically more fruitful after someone has had an encounter with Jesus Christ. This is the terminology that you hear the Holy Father using. Come and see. He means encounter. So I'm on the green band here. Then we, after someone has had an encounter with Christ in and through the church, or maybe they've been moved at a particular retreat, the response to that encounter um, necessitates accompaniment. We need to walk with support and grow and, with that person. And after they have been accompanied, are they ready, more ready to receive um, life in community and for ongoing and deeper catechesis? And then they are sent forth in mission to share with others what they have received. This can happen over years. It can happen quicker. Um, the Lord um, knows what that looks like in someone's heart. Here are some of the methodologies, which is this tan band um, that really help um, look at where people are at. In pre-evangelization, these are your parents um, who are really, really working. Um, they're kind of like, the, I would say, the drag, drive, men and drop mentality. So um, these are the parents who will take the children to religious education, will drop them off, and will drive away, right? They're very much in pre-evangelization. So many of you are going to be offering amazing programs, amazing information, and your parents are not going to be taking you up on that. Part of it is that they don't really um, know what they don't know. And so they have not had a significant encounter with Jesus Christ, right? So I'm really appreciating that some of you are sending me little private comments right now and saying, this is right where our, our program is moving. This is a real um, help um, to, uh, ex to help people um, understand how we're moving along here. Is it realistic to expect that every person will become a disciple? Yes, absolutely. Jesus said, go and make disciples, not go and make bingo players or fish fry. As a church, um, the whole soul of our church needs to be moving toward evangelization and discipleship. It does not mean that everybody is going to become a shaper of culture. 
um, maybe a missionary disciple in the way that we sometimes think of that, which is, you know, moving more into apostolic leadership. But every one of our parishioners has the capacity to become a disciple, whether it's an early disciple, a growing disciple, or a mature disciple. Now, for folks in pre-evangelization, and it's estimated, well, I won't tell you yet. I'll keep that for you a little bit. But uh, quite a few of our parishioners are estimated to be in a stage of pre-evangelization. So let's use the chat bar. Um, what percentage of your parishioners do you think are in a pre-evangelization stage, meaning they have not had a significant encounter with Jesus Christ that they can articulate and speak out of? So, yeah. There's some beautiful comments coming in. Oh yes, just a note on the chart. You will have all my slides. You will have everything that you see here. Somebody saying 95, 65 to 75, 90, 80% most, 80, 80. There's just quite a few comments coming in here. Now, remember I am ministering in, in the US context. So this is gonna look a little bit different and it will look different in your own context as well. But just to make this concrete, it's estimated that about 70 to 85% of all Catholic parishioners are in this stage of pre-evangelization. It's like that layer underneath the iceberg. And then if we can move that group to, to being evangelized, um, they, that's going to pay, they pay rich dividends for us because they will reach back around to that second layer. If we have folks in our parishes who are already evangelized, and have a heart for the Lord, and we can really strengthen them up in mission and ministry, they can go out reaching for us. So we've got to take care of the core, and the core will also help us take care of those on the margins. And I'm sorry if this is, um, if, if this seems abrupt, and someone's like, oh my gosh, this is really, really difficult. It may be 95% in your ministerial context, it may be a little bit lower. One marker that you can use is mass attendance to determine this number. Um, which in, in my diocese floats anywhere between 20 and 28%. Uh, before the pandemic, it's down around 20% right now. We lost about 30% of our parishioners during the pandemic. But also um, the, the numbers of parents engaged in faith formation um, for, for those programming things, you can kind of look at those too. So there's a couple of different ways that you can measure that. This is what researchers typically suggest. It may be higher, it may be lower in your own context. I'm sorry if this seems like a little bit of frightening news, but I do believe that there's huge opportunity for us. So going back to my, what has been termed my ugly chart, the methodologies that work continue to carry through. So when we talk about folks in pre-evangelization, we have an opportunity to really, really lean into hope, healing and hospitality. Those methodologies really, really work with folks in that stage. It doesn't mean that they go away, it means that we carry them through, but they may not be ready for things like charism discernment or formal catechesis or scripture studies until they have a sense um, of, of being nurtured, received well, and moved more to that work um, of proclamation and the charigma, which we're gonna talk about in just a few moments here. Um, seeing a lot of comments come in. Um, so I'm just gonna just say, take some time to keep going here since we've got a lot happening and then I'll take some specific questions as well. So this is, oh, pardon me, a note from the new directory that I find very, very encouraging. We need to really look at what we're doing in fresh and new ways. The need for a renewed impulse of evangelization justifies the decision to rethink in a missionary vein all the pastoral activities of the Christian community. Yes, even the most ordinary and traditional ones. Even our fish fries, even our bingo, everything we have to look at. You know, we hear that in Evangelii Non Siandi, there's this beautiful quote that talks about the DNA of the church is to evangelize. The Holy Spirit is the, is the prime evangelizer, but the whole soul of the church is to evangelize and reach out. And so we need to really look at all of the things that we're doing in activities and not be afraid, as someone said in the chat earlier, to really, really take, um, take an initiative and to, to take some risks here. Or as Pope Francis would say, have courage, go forward, make noise. 
which I love. Three simple sentences. Have courage, go forward, and make noise. So let's keep going here just for a few moments because I want you to be able to give you some good stuff. When I work with parishes that really want to get on mission, there's a few key pieces around clarity of mission. You know, what is your local ministry and context looking like? What are the needs of the people? How many of your parishioners are in pre-evangelization? Um, how can you, um, I often say that hope, healing and hospitality are like the door openers. They're like the hinges that open the door for those in pre-evangelization. I'm just getting a note to myself that I need to slow down and just take a drink here. I am aware I do speak fast, but I'm very grateful that you're you're still with me here listening in. So thank you for your patience. I also want to look at this three-step process with them. It's a very simple process. Um, we are using this um, to actually look at that framework that I shared with you earlier, the Encounter Accompaniment Community Mission Framework. Here's the three questions. What do I need to start doing? What do I need to stop doing? And what do I need to keep doing in my life to be a disciple and in my ministry to form disciples? I tell our key parish staff that these are the questions that they need to be asking together. What do we need to start doing? What do we need to stop doing? And what do we need to keep doing? Now, because I'm in and out of parishes every day, and I mean that literally, I literally wrapped up my 28th event last night at a parish. And in the last month and a half, um, I love being out with our parishes. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in helping parishes plan for evangelization is that we want to start doing everything and we will not stop doing anything because we have little turf wars or our own little darlings that we maybe aren't bearing fruit as much, but we, are, we have to start really pruning so that we can have new growth come as we are more intentionally cultivating the soil um, for discipleship and for evangelization. I'm going backwards here because I wanna bring up my big ugly chart once more and tell you a little secret here. But this framework of encounter, accompaniment, community and mission is the framework that Pope Francis uses for discipleship. It's what he calls his formative itinerary for missionary discipleship. I know that because this is the framework that was also written into what is called the a Parasita document. Um, uh, that document was largely, largely written uh, for the Latin American church. And when I was working for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, I was given the opportunity to really translate and look at that framework. And that framework we adapted in the United States. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops have a document called Disciples Called to Witness that this whole framework is built into. So this is the framework that we are using to help people understand the vision for evangelization and discipleship. All as it goes back, you know, 2000 years, this isn't just associated with Pope Francis, but Pope Paul VI also continually talks about the encounter with Christ. So I just wanna mention that as a resource for you. Okay, so you'll have, again, you'll have all my notes, you'll have chart, I'll send you everything that I can, you'll have my three questions. Start, stop and keep doing. Um, again, very easy to, to do things um, that we've always done and not want to move into doing things differently, but we absolutely have to today. Yes. So follow-up is not easy. Yes, I just saw a note come in the chat bar. So again, when we talk about hope, healing, openness, prayer, and Eucharist, this is very apropos for us, especially with respect to folks in pre-evangelization and evangelization. Just a note that I have so many slides. I'm, I'm going to move ahead quite quickly here because I do want to get time to answer your questions as well. But we'll keep going for a few more minutes. Thank you. This is um, a, a quote from the Pope. This is where this healing, this healing focus has really come in. The thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It's useless to ask a seriously injured person if he's high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds. Now, just stop sharing just for a minute here. I don't know about you, but I find that in the pandemic or in this pandemic response as a church, 
um, we are seeing a lot of brokenness in our own context. And we really have to pay attention to what people are saying to us um, in their own lives. I think we're seeing more brokenness and more woundedness as a church than we've ever seen before. And so as a church, how do we press into that? How do we assess the needs of our community? And how do we really encourage people to really um, to see our churches and our church communities as centers of healing? So that means for many of us in ministry, we have to move to doing triage. And triage is where we see a lot of the opportunity for us as a church. So I have too many slides here. I'm just going to say that. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes. And then I'm going to give you some time to ask those questions. When we look at Jesus's person and we look at it as we approach Holy Week coming up very shortly, um, Jesus appears in, in, his, in his resurrected body with the wounds, with his wounds clearly visible. This is teaching us something about how we need to appear as a church today. Do we allow people to touch, to touch the wounds of Jesus and have their own wounds healed by Jesus? So healing ministries for evangelization are going to become incredibly important, not just physical healing, but I'm talking about spiritual healing, healing of encouragement, bringing families together, even having our parishes be centers of um, spiritual growth where people can really talk about what the pandemic has done and affected in them and a place to bring the trauma from the last couple of years into um, the light of our faith. So again, Jesus allowed his own wounds to be touched. He appears and he's telling us something that as a church, we need to also allow um, the woundedness um, of, of our own wounds and the Lord's to meet each other. That's where we find redemption. The second thing I would say here is prayer is incredibly important. Prayer ministry at this time is huge. If you are here and you are on parish staff and you are not spending a lot of time in prayer, this is a problem. Our parishes need to be centers of prayer. And unfortunately, the one place that I can systematically find where people are not praying is with their parish team. And I'm talking about deep intercessory prayer where people are coming together and praying every day as a team. We need to be spending time in prayer. This is the first method of Jesus. He teaches that when he goes to choose disciples, he goes out to pray and then he comes back. I'm not talking about the five minute prayer before the random, um, you know, the five minute prayer before the meeting that happens. I'm talking about deep, intercessory prayer where we're really calling upon the power of the Holy Spirit. My own bishop is a good model here of this Bishop Ricken because we'll get into some um, difficult conversations as an executive team here at the diocese and there's different opinions of different things which is great it's healthy and Bishop will stop and say time out everyone I'm hearing a lot of different ways that we could go about it it's time to go before the Lord let's just take a few minutes for silence and let's listen for the grace of the Holy Spirit. Prayer together as a team is not optional. This is something that I think our parish teams need to be better at. And I have a note from Marge saying here, no rush, Julianne, you can keep going. So I'm going to keep going. So we read in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus went out to the mountain to pray and he spent the night in prayer. And when day came, again, notice that the call follows after the prayer. He chose 12 of them. So Jesus spent this is the first method modeled by him because it teaches us that we need to also adopt this posture of prayer in order to choose others. So um, I think that this is hugely important for us. So let's keep going. Here. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from Evangeli Gaudium from The Joy of the Gospel. Without prolonged moments of adoration, of prayerful encounter with the word, of sincere conversation with the Lord, our work becomes meaningless. We lose energy as a result of weariness and difficulties and our fervor dies out. Listen to this. The church urgently needs the deep breath of prayer. So a friend of mine is a bishop in on one of the coasts. Let's just leave it at that. And he mediated some of the race riots that happened actually 25 years ago, where he brought together the police departments and some of those engaged in um, protesting at that time. And 
what was incredible to me was the approach that he took. He did it through Lexio Divina and sharing stories, bringing people together to read and reflect prayerfully on the scriptures and to hear the stories of what each community was struggling with. And he's just such a witness to me in allowing the capacity of prayer and the word of God to really touch people who are hurting and who are wounded. I think many times that we think um, that we have to have a lot of jazzy solutions to things. And I do think that we need to do new things in different ways, but I also think that we need to really look at our faith with fresh eyes and really allow prayer and the breath of the Holy Spirit to breathe new life into our communities. So we need that deep breath of prayer. If Eucharist is the heart of our parish, then our prayer has to be the heartbeat. So for you as parish staff, in, if you want to evangelize, if you want to make disciples, the first place that you need to make disciples and evangelize is in that parish team. If you're a pastor who is here today, your mission field isn't all of your parishioners. Your first mission field is actually your parish team. Um, for, if you're a catechetical leader, a lot of times we think our mission field are those children. Your first mission field is your catechists so that your catechists can go out and evangelize and disciple others. I have a huge heart for our catechists, by the way, if you're here as catechists, um, that was what I spent quite a few years doing. The piece I also think that we have to look at is the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. In the US, um, half of all Catholics don't believe in the real Christ, presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They don't understand it. They believe that it is actually a symbol. And we've had numerous studies that have verified this. When we talk about encounter, there is no more personal way that you can encounter Jesus Christ than in the Eucharist. And one of our challenges is how do we get people to mass? But remember, if you look back at that chart that I showed you earlier, for people who are in pre-evangelization, Getting them to Mass is at a little, little later stage of development for them. Getting them to some social events, getting them to things for their children, encouraging them, healing, hope, prayer, all of those will pave the way for them to have an encounter with the Lord in the Eucharist. Um, I also think we need to look at um, this particular quote here which is basically this charismatic catechesis and evangelization we're called to as a church. Evangelization will always contain as the center foundation at the same time, a clear proclamation that in Jesus Christ, the son of God made man who died and rose from the dead, salvation is offered to all men as a gift of God's grace and mercy. When you think of the word charisma, this statement should come to mind. The charisma is what Pope Francis is calling us as a church to preach, to teach, to witness to. And this is how he says, he calls it first proclamation or charisma. He uses the words interchangeably. On our lips, the first proclamation must ring out over and over. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. What a beautiful, hopeful message for our folks today. I'm just going to take off my screen sharing here. Yes, I'm seeing from Patricia here in the chat bar that we, we do. We need to involve our people more directly in, in discipleship, in the focus um, of um, moving people to a deeper stage of faith. Now, if you are here today and you are saying to me, this is all very well and good, can you share with me a scriptural encounter with Jesus, I want to take you to the woman at the well, um, which we just had recently in some of our readings. So pardon me while I toggle back and forth here. So you have in, I want to focus at the woman at the well, because for many of us, this would be a very tricky encounter with the Lord, right? The woman is living in, in a way that um, she feels excludes her and others feel that she is excluded from the grace and the mercy of God. And she comes to the well, which is what I want to focus on. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. When we talk about evangelizing encounters of hope, the woman at the well really speaks and looms large for me, not because of her sin, although she's called to repent and convert, absolutely, but because of Jesus's encounter with her where he really um, calls her to look at what she's thirsty for in life. 
that's something we have to ask today. How are our people hungry for the Lord? How are they expressing thirst for him? And Jesus says, indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So he's using that word. He's at the well and he's using the word welling up here. So that I've meditated on this passage for years. And I really wanted to focus with you on the well. Um, we have a well in our village in Ireland. In fact, um, it dried up, but I was dared. There's a ladder on the side. If anyone's listening, this is a terrible idea. And you know that. But I would dare to climb into the well as a child. And so I did. Climbed all the way down. And I got to the bottom of the well. I looked up and I could see all my cousins' faces. And I could see light. But when they looked down, they couldn't see me very clearly. And they're like, what's down there? And I'm like, it's deep, it's dark, it's muddy. So when they looked down the well, they could see deep, dark, swampy blackness. But at the bottom of the well, I could look up and see the light. And I think this is a real key for us in walking with people at any stage of faith. This encounter with Jesus took place at the well. Jesus could look into the well of this woman's heart and he saw all that she was struggling with. You know, he said to her, go get your husband. And she says, but um, I do not have a husband. Um, and he says, you're right. In fact, the person you're living with is, is not your husband. You have had many husbands. That isn't the end point of Jesus's encounter of hope with her. He encourages her to look up to the light. And so in our efforts in walking with parents and particularly walking with those in pre-evangelization, there's a tendency to use what's called a pushed strategy of evangelization. Um, and we have to be very, very careful. Push strategies emphasize a lot of times behavior, which we sometimes need to do. And we certainly do when we're talking about repentance and conversion. But pull strategies are story strategies. And we learned that Jesus as a teacher used pull strategies like storytelling more often than any other in the Bible. So yes, he taught, yes, he catechized, but he also told through story. And in this encounter with Jesus, I believe that the well is a really good metaphor for us in helping us to encourage people who are in pre-evangelization to really look to the light of Christ, because that is where he is where we find our hope. So after that encounter, she leaves her water jar behind. And anytime you've had a conversion, like the researchers say that there is a major conversion that happens in the life of every person. And then life is a series of ongoing conversions after that. She leaves her water jar. She has converted her life to the Lord. And so what she was thirsty for, she is left behind. And I think that is so true for people that we are ministering today is how are, we, how are we inviting them in to slake of their thirst and their hunger for the Lord? Storytelling, I mentioned, is a great resource. And I have a very simple little story analogy um, to help people tell their story of faith. Um, if you're an RCIA faith formation, help your catechists, help those that you're walking with tell their story. I have a resource that I will send to you on this. It's a kind of a plug and play resource. You can use it as an in-service. You can use it with other folks, but how do you help people tell their story of faith in the light of the gospel? So I'll make sure I send several of those for you. Some of them are for adults. Some of them are for children. So use them. I'm happy that you can um, share those with those you minister to. I want to leave you with this. Um, we'll almost leave you with this. I'll answer questions, but leave you with this paradigm. I get homesick for Ireland quite a bit. And um, I, so this is an image of Aer Lingus, which is Ireland's national airline. But as I want to encourage you to move into this paradigm, three words come to mind. When an airplane gets into a state of stress, which is a state of de-stress, um, the radio traffic control tower will tell anybody in a state of stress to do three things, aviate, navigate, and communicate. And I think it's really good for us. Sometimes as, as we feel as a church that we're in a state of stress or distress, and like, what are we going to do? People are leaving. Take a deep breath. Allow the grace of the Holy Spirit to breathe into this paradigm and keep going. The first one is aviate. Don't stop flying. Whatever ministry you're in that the Lord has called you in, keep on going. Some of you are here today saying, I can't do this anymore. It's been such a tough year. Keep on going. 
keep your eye fixed on Jesus, connect to the life of the church in our communities, stay close to him in the sacraments, and keep on going, keep on flying. Navigate, navigate, navigate. Focus your eye on discipleship and evangelization and navigate to do that to that point. If you keep your eye focused on mission, it's going to mean you're less likely to go off course and get distracted in other things. And the last one is communicate, communicate, communicate. Communicate as a team, communicate with your people, communicate with those that you're serving. Two questions, I'll leave them in here for later time, um, which is how are we raising up the next generation of saints? And are we spending more time on triaging existing ministries that may be failing? Or are we really leaning into the Holy Spirit? I would really hope that you would lean into the Holy Spirit during this time. And if you're like, that's all well and good, Julianne, you're very excited about this, but I'm a bit scared. You have to remember this, the beautiful word called um, parisia. And it is a boldness. I call this be holy and be bold. This is a holy boldness where the, where the Holy Spirit really kind of invites us to leave a, a mark on this world. And to allow us to do this, Jesus himself comes and before us and says, do not be afraid. I am with you. So I love this. Be bold. Be a holy boldness, not reckless, a holy boldness for the Lord. You can connect with me here at my website or through Loyola Press, but I'm going to pause my screen sharing here so that I can take some of your questions. And I believe we have a moderator to do that. Thanks so much. Julianne, thank you so much. You have given us so much food for thought and options and, and, and challenges that I think we'll have weeks of conversation. But there are some very good comments coming through and questions in the, in the uh, question and answer box. One comes to us with, we find that parishioners and ministry groups desire a return to normal, so much so that they're resistant to change. So what needs and should change and how can we overcome that resistance? really great question. I think it's wise to be aware that in any change management process, including conversion and faith, it does take time. I will say that I have noticed for many of our ministers, and particularly our priests and our bishops, they have undergone a lot of trauma, as are we. We've buried loved ones, we've lost loved ones. So the pace of change needs to be really mediated through what people need. You can, um, in the change process, too much change can cause, cause chaos. Too little change can cause complacency. So I would say take the temperature of where people are at between chaos and complacency, and a few well-placed changes can, can really help. Effective preaching, um, visually attractive materials at this time, um, really allowing people a space to process what they need is important. If you rush change, particularly with folks in trauma, you will actually re-traumatize people and they will opt out. So that's a very, very astute question. I would say, again, prayer, uh, doing a focus group, bringing a small group of parishioners together and saying, what has the last two years been like? How can we make connections with people? What would serve your needs well during this time? Um, taking the temperature on where your people are for change would be important. I think that leads us into the next question, because many times we find people don't fit into one of the categories exactly, that they'll overlap. And this no. question was, when witnessing to a group of individuals at diverse stages of discipleship, some in pre-evangelization, some in evangelization, some in disciples, such as how often attend in baptismal preparation sessions, which methodology should be prioritized? Or what would you suggest they focus on? Yeah, so 80% of your parishioners, if you know that 80% of your parishioners are likely to be in pre-evangelization, that means a lot of our efforts actually for catechesis and faith formation are focused on a small group of parishioners. I think for certain things like baptismal prep, it's unusual to have parents who are further along, not impossible, but just unusual. Um, look at Jesus's methodologies very closely here. For some of those that are in pre-evangelization, you're going to need to have a one-on-one -on -one methodology. Jesus did one-on-one, -on -one, small group, and he spoke to the crowds. He did his best discipleship efforts in a small group and one-on-one. -on -one. And I think a lot of times we rely on large-scale presentations and programs to move people forward, and that isn't always the most effective. 
So if I was doing baptismal prep today, I'd be looking at a combination of one-on-one, -on -one, small group, and large group, because that way you can kind of take the temperature of where people are at, but you can delineate your response based on where people really are. It's not an easy question, by the way. I, I'm smiling to myself here because I'm thinking this is really hard, but it's it does require more, more multifaceted um, response. Many of our parishes are now finding themselves in um, situations where they have to look at how do they restart? How do they, how do they move forward? And this question comes from someone that says, how do we determine what needs to stop, what needs to begin, and what needs to continue? Yeah, this is a great question. I'm so grateful for your excellent moderating skills, too. Um, the three questions actually go to a different part. Actually, the three questions come from uh, a process, purification, discernment, and reform. We want to reform, we want to, and I mean that in the best sense of the word, we want to reform our processes that may be outdated or no longer working. Um, I'm not talking full scale Martin Luther Reformation here, right? Just to be clear, I'm talking about the reform that Pope Francis and all of our popes actually have called us to, which is to really um, lean into this moment as a church. Purification, discernment, and reform go together. That's where the three questions, what do I need to start, stop, and keep doing come from? Purification is the hardest part of the process. It's really to look at what is bearing fruit. Um, what is your process for moving people on from one stage to another? What, what we would call discipleship pathways do you have in place to walk people at various stages? And then what has no longer, what needs to be pruned in order to be more efficacious? That takes discernment. Discernment is always exercised in relationship. So that means systematic prayer, really thoughtful approach. I would say a couple of key questions like, is this, is this, does this speak to our mission? Is this what we're called to do today? Um, is this less important for mission? And is this actually taking from mission? I can't tell you how many parish ministers will say to me, I spend all my time setting up chairs and taking them down. And I feel like I'm less on mission. And I think that was what was really hard during COVID too, is many of us were, were so focused on tactical details rather than the one-on-one -on -one ministry or the group ministries that we were called to. Um, I do actually have a chart, which I'd be happy to send. And if you bear me, bear in mind with me, I'm going to write down a note to myself. I have a little chart around how do you evaluate what you should start, stop and keep. I'd be happy to send it to you. Perfect. I'll All make right. sure that that goes in my packet. Excellent. Now, when we talk about the the parish as a field hospital, or as the church as a field hospital, it raises a lot of concerns for people dealing with the wounded people, individuals as they come forward. And a question came in that is, what's the best way to meet parishioners in their woundedness, be that the pandemic, sex abuse scandals, indigenous school histories, etc., all of the different kinds of hurts that we're facing? That's a great question. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is going to be as varied as the needs that you have. And I know we're all wrestling with a lot of different kinds of woundedness. We have trauma from the pandemic and re-engaging and relighting fire for mission. We have folks that have lost a lot of um, people during the pandemic. We've had people who have long and ongoing health concerns from COVID. It was just not a nice time for us. And we have families that actually became more fractured during the pandemic. Um, because of the stresses upon them. A um, couple of things come to mind. I really I believe in doing listening sessions with people to really determine responses. And it's kind of a gut check for me on where people are at. One of the parishes that I had worked with here had done what they called hope and healing listening sessions. And so what they basically did is they provided a space, a prayerful space, um, that in involved some music, some prayer, and then a focus type conversation to say, we're going to open up the space in our church to really talk about, and this is really synodal, synodal actually, to really allow you to share what's on your heart and mind. And then it closed with some gospel proclamation, with some moment of prayer. And music has been really important for these experiences too. This parish did six hope and healing listening sessions and it just had a facilitator who just opened up the dialogue in terms of 
What do you wish our parish could do for people? How do you feel it's meeting your needs? It takes real guts to do this, by the way. You have to have the intestinal fortitude to put yourself out there. But I will say that parishes that are doing this throughout the world actually are finding that people aren't shy about telling you what you need. From that, you can kind of necessitate a response as well. I can send you a hope and healing listening session format if anyone would like that. Um, again, this was very specific and it's very general to what we did here as a curia. Um, we found during the pandemic, unfortunately, that some of our um, ministers lost their positions or our hours were cut. My own hours were cut. Our paychecks were cut. And so I want to be real about that. We did a series of hope and healing listening sessions with our parish teams. I'd be happy to share that format with you. That would be lovely. Certainly the time when we're in the, the middle of the synodal process and we're, we're doing activities with our parishes on listening, accompanying, and, and uh, participating in the life of the church. It's a time that we're, we're blending all of these things together. And I think you've given us a lot of, a lot of hope and support for, for what we can do. You've addressed most of the questions in the chat. Now, um, perhaps just as we, we get ready to bring our session to a close, Marg, um, Jillian, you could leave us with uh, some some oh. thoughts as we move forward. I think we have a, a bit more time, but our our, our questions are, I think, Absolutely. all been answered. Yeah. Um, I do have a few things to share with you if you're open to that, just kind of to close up. Oh, up with you. First of all, I saw a question come in on, you know, faith is personal and people still think it's private. Yeah. First of all, faith is personal. It's not meant to be kept private. So you may have folks in your parish who say to you, you know, I really, really believe that we are not called to share our faith, that it's enough for me to kind of go to mass and then just live my faith out in a private context. That's actually what the atheist coalitions of all of the world would really, really hope. They would hope that we would keep our faith private. Our faith is personal and there is a difference. We are meant to share, to proclaim, to teach, to preach our faith. And so that's one of the pieces that I would say to some of your folks who are here in that don't be afraid to really move into these paradigms where you see people um, press into that. I would say do some work around the kerygma. And I'm gonna pull up my slides on the kerygma here because I wanna tell you a story about the kerygma. Um, and I think we've got a little time for this as well here. But um, so we have the charisma is this first proclamation that really brings people alive. But I want to just tell you what this looks like. This has supposed to be at the center of all of our parish activities. Um, it comes from the Greek or karux, meaning to herald, which is, is the essential proclamation message. When I teach my children or children about the charisma, I often talk about the popcorn kernel. This is the seed. And once it pops, everything seems to fit together for faith. Now, we know from every culture around the world, world, world that we have a culture of proclamation. You know, you have the town crier in England, he'll hear ye, you'll hear ye. In Massachusetts, you have the town crier who uh, proclaimed various town announcements. In the Congo, they have a tradition. Every culture in the world has its own sort of town crier herald, if you will. We need to help equip our parishioners to be the herald of the good news. When I say to a lot of Catholic parishioners, I will tell you over and over, I hear this from them. I'm not comfortable seeing myself as an evangelizer. The word evangelization is very hard for me. I almost have a, an allergy to it. And this is something that we need to get over as Catholics. Evangelization is not proselytization, right? There is a difference between those things. Our faith calls us to share the good news. And one of the best ways that you can do that is through what's called the kerygma, which is looking at the basic, mo basic movement of salvation history and living, teaching, sharing out of that movement. Now, the kerygma has a couple of different movements here, and I was really, really hoping that we would get to that today, so I'm glad we have time for this. A charismatic statement is that we no longer use, but is charismatic is Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Basic pattern of the charisma is there, right? Another way of looking at the charisma is like this. The creation, God created each one of us to be in relationship with us and he loves us. 
And then we had the fall or original sin. I've broken my relationship with God by my sin. And then the salvation and redemption movement here is that God sends us his, his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us and save us from the weight of sin. And we have been recreated in the Holy Spirit and being sent out on mission to share the good news. So a lot of times people will say to me, I don't have a story of faith. And I say, what do you mean? They'll say, oh, I'm sure you, well, I'm Irish, so I can story tell to the day is long. My husband often says if the Irish were, um, had a, a team sport in the Olympics, it would be storytelling. And my wife would be team captain. Fun little random fact there, um, which is uh, interesting. But the word is at the center of all of our cu cultures. So how do we help our parishioners live out and share the good news? I think it's by equipping them to share their story. And yet for many Catholics, they will say, I'm afraid to evangelize. If you don't know your story, you're not going to be able to evangelize. So um, I will say to people, have you ever had your heart broken? Have you ever lost somebody you loved? Have you ever had a relationship that went sour in a way that you didn't like? Sure, we've all had those moments. Then you have a story of faith. When your story and the gospel story come together, it becomes our story as a people. And we have to help people um, live and share out of their story. Now, you're like, I don't understand what this looks like. So I'm glad that I have time for a little story with you today. I would hear that we have to live out of the charisma and it needs to be at the center of all of our parish activities. And I didn't realize how difficult that was for me. And I am going to share with you a very uh, a story. This is a hard story to share, but it's an important one just so we can understand the power of the charisma to speak. I worked at a boarding school, um, a non-denominational, scientifically-based boarding school. I typically wear a crucifix, and when I was hired, it was noted and said, you know, you can wear that on its own, but you cannot be putting crucifixes up around your office or, or religious art. Um, after I had snuck in one of my favorite images of Jesus and put it on my wall, I didn't realize that um, that was going to be an issue. And so a lot of People at the school knew that I was a person of faith. And one day, a little jar of McCormick mustard seeds appeared on my desk. And I had no context for this, um, but the jar of mustard seeds appeared uh, with a note that said, you are the mustard seed uh, here in our campus. As a Christian, thank you for being here. And, and that was it. And so um, I had a real test about a, a week or actually about a month into to working at that school. And um, one of my students came in, and just a warning if anyone's listening here, uh, this, this is a difficult story. And a student passed out in my office. And when um, I ran and grabbed some help and he came to, um, this student had actually tried to take his own life that day. And his mother came to me and said, you know, because I was a school counselor, can you walk with my son? And I said, I'd be happy to, but I can't talk to him about faith. And so um, as a school community, we can work with our school psychologists and our counselors and we can get our medical team involved and the dean is very supportive, but I can't actually talk to him about this component that I think would really help, um, help him in a sense. Um, look at the pain that he's experiencing. And she said, well, how about if you do it off campus and on the weekend? And I said, I can do that. And I started, I gave this young man this prayer card and it's, it's taken from an image of Caravaggio and it's Christ on a split rock. And it is an image of Christ descending into hell. And I gave this to my student, Nick, and I said to him, I want to tell you about my faith and I want to talk to you about Jesus. And I will tell you that Nick was Christian. And um, I want to give you this card. And he said, why? And I said, because this metaphor represents Christ's descent into hell. And we say that, we say it, we hear it every mass, but Christ's descent into hell um, is real. I said, the day that you were held against the wall by those boys who are bullying you you felt like you were living in in a hell and christ there is no hell that you can't walk in your life where christ has not walked before he was right beside you he will be with you and i'm giving you this prayer card as a reminder of that moment so that 
movement happened and we walked with Nick and Nick graduated. I would say there's two miracles in this story. The first miracle is that the jar of mustard seeds was given by the Dean of Students, who was a fallen away Catholic, um, but came back to his Catholic faith and he became my husband. And then the second miracle in the story was Nick, who invited us to his graduation and chose to share his story of how he was living his faith. And this prayer card took it out of his pocket. It meant the absolute world to him. And so I say that Nick's conversion to Catholicism was the second miracle. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know that this was an evangelizing encounter of hope. I just knew that this young man in the depths of its despair needed to hear that Christ himself had conquered the weight of the pain and suffering and sin in his life. And so that's the power of the charisma to really touch people's hearts, to bring alive the encounters of faith. So if you're like, I don't know what the charisma is, how has the message of the gospel been written large into your life that you can preach, teach and share with people who are suffering and struggling. As a church, we have good news to share. That's what the word evangelization means. It means good news. And so what good news can you share with someone who is suffering? So I'm really glad I wanted to share that story with you. I didn't know if I would have time. It's in my slides, but thankfully Dave gave me a window to be able to do that today. With I'm you. so glad you did, Michelle. Uh, there, that was wonderful very much, Julian. And Michelle now is going to have a few words to say. So um, on behalf of the organizers and Marg um, and each of us on the call today, Julianne, thank you. That was an incredible presentation. Um, the content and the way in which you communicated your method, you engaged us, you used the chat like I've never seen anyone use the chat before. Um, it really, really incredible. Um, you spoke so elegantly and meaningfully to discipleship and evangelization. Um, and you link so well the, the gospel mission to the context of our times um, and, and what we're all living uh, still right now in these in these pandemic days that we do hope are, are coming to a close. Um, but you spoke really profoundly to our experience where we are as persons, families, um, church and faith communities um, and, and really a beautiful focus on healing and um, spiritual growth and the, the best part is you gave us real concrete tangible um, ways to do it ideas really really concrete tools and i know everyone um, is looking forward to receiving your package uh, i think that is pretty clear that everyone is really looking forward to receiving that so um, your presentation today was one of holy boldness you have been a witness a holy bold witness and we are so grateful thank you Thank you very much, Michelle uh, and, and Julianne. I want to say um, that, uh, Julianne, the um, chart, that ugly chart that you talk about, uh, has inspired me time and time again. I, have, I saw it one, one other time when we talked about it back in the fall. Um, I, I have been so impressed and so pleased that you were able to join us today, and I know that uh, your um, presentation will have echoes uh, throughout the rest of our series, but also going forward. So I thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And um, if I could just ask uh, uh, maybe um, Julianne and David and Brandon and Michelle just to stay on uh, at the end. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye.